Welcome all of you. We'll go ahead and get started. Scott Leanna will join us in a couple minutes. Um, given that today is St. Patrick's Day, instead of starting us with a prayer, I thought I would start with an Irish hymn. So I'm going to sing. If you want to sing along, great. Mute your microphone if you're going to do that. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that. And by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Light of my soul, after victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O oh, heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Um, I would like to introduce you to Mark Ehrman. Mark is our chancellor for the diocese, and he will be speaking about the constitutions and canons tonight. He understands them more than most and um, will do a better job than anyone else will do at explaining what they are. If you have any questions, he'll be happy to answer them too. Mark, go ahead. Uh, thanks. And uh... Before I start, I just want to apologize a little bit for the lighting in this. I'm in our in a visitor's office in our Milwaukee office, so I don't have the normal lighting uh, with nice background stuff that I have in my office in Madison. But uh, in any event, um, here with you tonight, and thanks for having me. Um, in, in case you're wondering, the the chancellor of the diocese is basically like the the legal, you know, the chief legal counsel. Um, I'm an attorney at Quarles and Brady. And Quarles has had a long time association with the diocese. My father actually was chancellor for many years before he retired. And then after he was uh, there, Stuart Parsons served as chancellor for a while, Liz Orlup, you may, may recognize those names and now I'm in this position. So I'm gonna just spend a few minutes kind of walking through some of the general constitution and canons that, that affect, uh, you know, particularly vestries and parishes. Um, the, the Constitution canons are uh, accessible on the, the Episcopal Diocese website. If you go to the governor's, Governance and Structure tab, then there's a link to the, the canons there's, and the Constitution. There are several pages um, that go kind of on and on, a lot of legal stuff. And I'm going to try to just summarize a few things that are, I think, important for your group to, to be aware of. So I'm going to start with the Constitution. If, if you're familiar with how companies are run, you know, there's there's like an articles of organization or articles of incorporation. That's typically the uh, kind of the, the overall governing document. And I would I would view the Constitution kind of like that. Uh, the canons are a little bit more specific and get into more granular detail on some issues. So the Constitution really covers things like, um, you know, it establishes the diocese itself. It talks about how the diocese interacts with churches, the national church, the local churches. It provides a lot of rules on convention. It establishes the you know, roles of the bishop, the roles of the standing committee and the executive council. And there's really not much in the constitution that directly affects the, the individual churches as much as there is in the canon. So I'm gonna spend most of my time kind of talking about the canons and specifically some of the ones that, that affect the, um, the parishes. So I think the first one, I would say the beginning part of the canons, again, have a lot of information about uh, the convention, who can attend the convention, how the voting works, the function of the executive committee. There's a whole uh, canon on what the executive committee does, how it's constituted, what role it has. There's another one on the standing committee again, establishing those two units. So if, if you're thinking about a company, I would say the canons are more like the bylaws of the company. They kind of provide the operational guidelines for how the, the diocese interacts with the parishes and how the parishes should interact as they, as they have their meetings. And so the first canon I wanna mention is canon 23, which, which has to do with parish meetings. 
And that canon um, basically says that you have, you're supposed to have meetings <clears throat> as provided in the bylaws of your vestry. So a lot of vestries have bylaws. If you don't have a, if you don't have vestry bylaws, <clears throat> then the vestry can just call a meeting. But you, you should have at least, and I'm sure you do, but you should have at least one formal annual meeting and then as many other meetings as you want. And Canon 23 talks about, you know, what happens at kind of that, that main annual meeting. You're supposed to elect a senior warden, a junior warden, and other vestry people. And you're also supposed to elect your, you know, your attendees at the, at the annual convention. And it basically says that any adult communicant in good standing is, is allowed to serve um, and to attend at the parish meeting. So it's designed to be an open meeting for the parish members. And um, I'm gonna put my glasses on here so I can read this a little bit better. Um, you're supposed to keep a, a roll call of who attends the meeting and minutes of the meeting. And um, like you would at a meeting of a company or a group that you attend if you're on boards of other, of other organizations. So that's really Canon 23. Um, if you don't, for some reason, have um, like an annual elect, election of vestry people, then the way it works is your, your existing people serving in those roles just continue to serve until you elect somebody else. So it's not like you, you kind of lose people uh, from those roles if you don't have a, a meeting or if your meeting's you know, held not exactly within a year time frame. Canon 24, that deals with special meetings. So you have your kind of regular meetings and your special meeting. And special meetings would cover really whatever thing, whatever business you think you might need to do uh, you know, between an annual meeting. And uh, parish meetings are basically called by the bishop, uh, the rector, or, or any, uh, any, you know, the vestry group as a whole. And the canon provides, you're supposed, you know, you're, you're supposed to give notice, and the notice has to be, for special meetings, it's supposed to be read publicly in the, at the parish, at the service, and on, on the next two Sundays preceding the meeting. So there's a formal procedure to if you are going to have a special meeting that you're, you're supposed to give people notice in that manner. And then the rector uh, provides, um, it, it provide, presides at that meeting. And if the rector's not there, then the bishop. And if the bishop's not there or the rector, then, then you have one of the wardens that would preside at that meeting. So that's Canon 24. Canon 25 specifically deals, and again, that's special meetings of the church, not the vestry. The vestry has its own canon, and that's can, Canon 25. And that says that you're supposed to have regular meetings of the vestry, and it says at least quarter slash annually. So I think they've given you, I mean, I think most vestries meet at least quarterly. It's not kind of considered good practice. You can also have special meetings in, the, you know, in between those regular meetings, and that can be called at the request of the rector or any two vestry people. And um, you're supposed to provide notice again to people and um, uh, you're supposed to provide kind of a general guideline of what agenda items you're gonna cover at that meeting. And um, in order to be a valid vestry meeting, you need to have the rector present or if one of the rectors is not present, then, or, or if the rector is not present, then one of the wardens would need to preside at that meeting. And then you also have to have a quorum uh, of the vestry, which basically means at least half of the vestry people would need to be at the meeting in order for it to be considered a valid meeting. Uh, you're supposed to take note, take minutes of the meeting, and then have those minutes read at the next meeting, you know, so that they can be approved and adopted as minutes of the of the. Uh, the vestry meetings. Uh, the bishop also has the right to call a special meeting. That doesn't happen very often, but, but Canon 25 does give the bishop that right. If for some reason the bishop thinks that there needs to be you know, some uh, special meeting called. Do you mean a special meeting at the parish or a special meeting for the diocese? At the parish too, the bishop can call that at the parish. You can also call it for the diocese, but yes. Right. So that's Canon 25. So Canon 27 is the next one that would apply. And that is um, really the, the canon that establishes the wardens in the vestry. And it's, it's fairly broadly worded, but it basically says the rector warns the members of the vestry together will constitute the vestry. 
<laughs> and you know, it's kind of a basic statement. So that's section one. And then the role of the vestry is really, I would say it's like a board of directors of a company. You're basically the caretaker of the, of the parish. And you're supposed to care for, protect the church building and buildings, see that they are in good and reverent repair and are sufficiently insured. Um, make sure that there's you know, a space for the orderly worship of God and the proper administration of the sacraments. So there's some specific things that they, they charge the vestry with doing. Again, very broadly written. And I'm sure all the vestry people on the call are doing that already. So if, um, you know, generally the rector would preside at that, but if you don't have a rector or if the rector's not present, then you, you'd have the wardens in the order of seniority provide, preside at that meeting. And they, again, make sure that they, um, they follow the guidelines. And I, if you don't have a rector, you can also, basically the wardens, and again, in the order of seniority would kind of act for the rector um, if you're between rectors, you know, on, on a church administration items. Uh, if there is a section four actually deals specifically with vacancies. So if you have a, a rector who's resigned or for whatever reason has left, then the vestry needs to elect the rector. Um, and you have to basically notify the ecclesiastic authority, which usually is the bishop. But if there's no, you know, be, before Bishop Lee was installed, there was the standing committee acting as ecclesiastic authority. Um, and there's some procedures in section four as to what, um, you know, how, how the rector is, is appointed and elected. Um, you're supposed to maintain the finances in a proper manner so that they're in good condition, whatever that means for finances. I mean, obviously that's part of your goal, your role as a, as a vestry person to try to keep the church uh, solvent and, um, and have expenses paid and bills paid. There's a, um, the, the canon calls for a clerk and a treasurer. A clerk is really like a secretary. Uh, I would view a secretary of the organization, really responsible for keeping minutes of the meeting, keeping notes, keeping the records of the vestry organized, like a secretary of a company would do, or a secretary of a board of directors. And then the treasurer, it's probably obvious, but the treasurer is collecting, receiving money, dispersing money, acting like a, a treasurer would for an organization. And, and, the can, and that canon has specific, some specific roles on each of those. And then the last thing that that canon says is you're supposed to, once you have a rector in place or selected, um, you have to have, you're supposed to have a covenant agreement with the rector, which is basically like a, you know, for lack of a word, a better word, an employment agreement that deals with, you know, how, how the parish will be managed, what the rector's, rector, his duties are and uh, how any responsibilities would be shared. And that's supposed to be done in consultation with the bishop under that canon. So that's canon 27. The only other canons I'll mention are canon 29. Um, that hopefully won't come up, but there is a canon specifically dealing with what happens if a rector resigns or if for some reason you need to you know, force the rector to resign. Um, because um, the way the cans are set up, rectors really aren't supposed to voluntarily resign. They're supposed to be appointed. And, and it's not like a normal employment relationship where you can you know, resign and leave and go to another parish. There's a procedure involved if the, if the rector wants to leave. And then um, this canon has some fairly lengthy procedures as to what happens if there's some sort of dispute between the rector and the vestry and how that dispute is resolved. Like I say, I hope that doesn't come up, but if it does, there's a canon that specifically deals with that. And then the last canon I'll mention is canon 20, which is um, basically it's, it's, it's a canon which talks about standard business methods for churches. And um, it says every parish needs to have sort of the following general standards of business. And it says um, funds need to be deposited in, you know, in a normal accounts. In other words, in accounts that are insured, federally insured accounts, not, you know, underneath someone's mattress, obviously. You have to keep records um, and uh, um, 
keep permanent records and 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 tell people where those records are are maintained in case anybody wants to know. Um, treasures and custodians need to be you know should be at least somewhat experienced in dealing with money. I mean that's that's again sort of obvious, but but the canon does deal with that. Um, you have to keep books so that you can and, and financial records so you can do an accurate accounting and and prepare financial statements. Again, these are, are sort of obvious things, but the canon specifically deals with that. And then you're supposed to keep all your building and property adequately insured. The canon specifically uh, references that. And then it also says basically the executive council can ask for any of these, you know, any records that you have upon reasonable request. So um, that was kind of a short summary of a lot of pages of text. I tried to highlight the the, you know, the canons that would be applicable to you know to this group, but happy to answer questions or or address other things. And if you if you do get a chance, you can like I said, pull these up online. And there's a lot of text, a lot of legalese. I posted them here, and I'll include them when I send okay. this out tomorrow. I should also say, if, if you don't have questions tonight, um, you know, Sarah's got my contact and I'm always happy to, you know, take individual emails or calls or whatever. If, so if you have a specific question, because so sometimes, you know, having the general doesn't really mean a lot until you have a specific situation or a specific set of facts where you say, like, I wonder what the canon means if this set of, you know, if, in this situation. So happy to, you know, address those if they come up over time. Yeah, one thing that we didn't anticipate last year, well, we didn't anticipate a lot, but um, how to handle um, annual meetings, which are supposed to be held generally in January. And, you know, if you can't meet, what are you going right. to do about that? And so that that became a, oh, we didn't we didn't think about this issue that needed clarification. Right. And, and, and I think the canons give you some leeway on that. I mean, again, like I said, if you if you have vestry in place and you don't meet in January, you know, the vestry still is supposed to, you know, they still stay in place until you ultimately meet if it's in like March or whatever. Right. Um, one of the things we did at the convention, I think it was two years ago, we did actually change um, the canon on, on the convention to allow for the virtual convention. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, I don't know who was involved in that, but we actually had to have a, sep a separate, um, like convention. We had to have a meeting and we didn't want anybody to come, but we didn't want it to be in secret right. because it was public. Right. So, the, so I think there were like three people there because um, they need to be like three people there to have a quorum. So there were like three people that met you know, uh, socially distanced to adopt the canon that allowed for the main convention to be done virtually. So, uh, so that's there now and you could continue to do that in the future if you wanted. Yep. And I would say a lot of um, a lot of organizations we work with, just private companies, have have changed. You know, if, if they formally, if their if their bylaws didn't allow them to do that, a lot of them have changed it so that they have the flexibility to do it in the future, because it just makes it easier. You know, one of the things, it, it, you know, even though you have meetings virtually, you know. You obviously need to still keep minutes of it and and you should note in there that um, I always know when I'm doing it that like if you have a meeting on zoom that people acknowledge that they can see and hear each other so that it's clear for the record that you know it's it's while you're gathered you're gathered together just not in person so Any questions? Well, I know this is being recorded and Sarah received several regrets, uh, perhaps because of the feast day of St. Patrick, <laughs> but um, I can attest from personal experience, uh, Mark is super responsive, really clear, uh, extremely helpful. Um, so, uh, if, uh, if something does come up, um, I'm saying to those of you gathered here and to those of you who may be listening to the recording, um, really don't hesitate to, to reach out to him. Yes, and I thank you. For your time.
among those of us that are here, do you guys know, are your vestries meeting in person yet or are they still virtual? Us at St. Peter's are still virtual and probably will be for the foreseeable future until whatever variants seem to go away, but we've been doing them virtual. It, it, it's, it's easier, you know, you can, you know, people don't have to drive in from all over at night. So, and it's still, it's still effective. So that's where we're at. At Trinity, they're doing, I think they met once or twice in person in the fall when things were looking better. And then we went back to Zoom again. <clears throat> I was out of town for one of them and then all the, so I think they maybe did one and then they went back to Zoom. At St. Mark's, the church where I work, they are mostly meeting in person, not always, but when they have been meeting in person, um, they meet in the large parish hall and they all have um, their own card table set up around. So they, they have a lot of distance between people. Thank you. Before I worked full time with the diocese, I was at St. Thomas of Canterbury, Greendale, and um, folks there just missed each other, <laughs> like physically, they missed the physical presence. And so uh, they started meeting in the parish hall very spread out, but um, but they just wanted to be able to see each other and, and interact in person that way. Good question. Well, I have a couple of questions for discussion, unless anyone has anything else for Mark. The first question I have is what's um, one, go ahead. Sarah, I just wonder if we wanna give Mark the option then to scoot into the rest of his evening. I uh, did earlier. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll probably uh, sign off here so I, since I have to drive back to Madison, so. Um, right. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Thanks. Good to nice see you, Mark. You. Thanks. Good to see you. Bye. Take care. Bye. So our question, uh, what's one thing you wish you knew about starting your role as warden or treasurer before you started? <laughs> Come to mind, Sarah. <laughs> How much work was involved? Yeah. Okay. There, you now muted. Wish I would have paid more attention to, uh, I guess, the canons because when our priest left, I just silly was so silly to assume the deacon was in charge. And then when they said the senior warden was in charge, I was like, "What? I, I'm, I'm the senior warden." Like, what? But um, so that's one thing I should have paid more attention to. Was the, the hierarchy of the church. That is an unexpected thing. Yeah, the deacons are um are serve at the 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 bishop's placement. Right. But he just knows so much more than I do. So I just assumed that he'd be in charge. You have a, you have a, an exceptional deacon. Right, we do. We have amazing. I was singing his praises earlier today. Oh, were you? Yes. Oh. Uh, uh, the uh, person who's in charge of camp, summer camp for kids, uh, wanted to get in touch with the person who manages our safe church things. And so that is Terry Garner. Yeah, he does a great job. Yes, he sure does. Anyone have any other surprising things that you wish you knew before you started? Yeah, I wish, I wish I would have known there was going to be a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> but yep. all in all, it was okay. And, and our, our um, priest left, and, and that was a challenge to, to find one. But we got through that before the pandemic, so it's all good. Yes. I wish I would have known that to turn on the outside water at our church, you have to crawl under the bathroom in the rector's office and reach up into a hole in the wall to find the bell. <laughs> so that was something we didn't know about. <laughs> so is that information that your oh, previous yes, rector knew? 
Oh yes, we have a lot. We have a list of things we've learned. Yeah, okay. like how to yeah, you crawl under the sink and reach your hand up into the wall and turn on the valve. But yeah, it's the manual <laughs> you'll pass on to your successor. Which goes to show, you know, all the importance of keeping good records that we apparently weren't doing very well of. You know, everybody knew a little bit, but nobody knew everything. Hmm. And the other question I have is, what's a project that your parish is working on now that is exciting you? We're working on an undercroft to uh, get rid of the asbestos in the floor and then paint the walls, redo the walls, and then... Uh, we do it for after COVID so we can have our pancake supper and, and cookie cupboard and everything down there again, hopefully later on this year. So that's what we're doing at St. Peter's. It's new that's and exciting. exciting. Are you, are you um, uncovering anything in the walls or that? We're not that quite that far yet, but so far, no. <laughs> you finding the valve to turn on the sprinkler? <laughs> <laughs> no, we all, everybody pretty much knew where it was, so. <laughs> no manual needed for that. No manual needed. <laughs> Beth, is there anything exciting that you have enthusiasm about at Trinity? Well, they were, um, we were just talking at a vestry meeting the other night because our sacristy had a lot of water damage from oh. the bad rains in the summer. And so that's going to be a big undertaking of um, replacing cabinets, replacing floor, that type of thing. So I don't know if it's exciting, but it's necessary, it's necessary and hopefully can correct some of the issues that we had problems with. Are you going to replace it with the same kind of configuration or are you redoing that no i think it's pretty much configuration they're going to have to dig because they think there's no um drain tiles and that's part of our issue with the water getting in because the sacristy is below grade and um and just you know it it needed something it's just unfortunate you didn't need a whole bunch of rain to <laughs> be floating everything everywhere before you on a it. sunday morning no less that's exactly right. They came in and water had gone into the <laughs> church and down the steps to the um, Sunday school rooms and all over the place. Yeah. yeah. I think that was the same morning. I think Mequon, you guys were out of power that Sunday or somebody was out of power on the same Sunday. It was a big day. Yeah. Does your insurance cover that? No. Mm -mm. probably one of the reasons why it's um, important to have an insurance audit to make sure that you yeah I'm not sure the from flooding, what with flooding doesn't always get covered right yeah it doesn't always there yeah, is that something most churches go through an insurance audit um I, I occasionally I don't know that it's a that practice that every five years you do it okay. but Okay. I think that um, especially if you have um, a building project that you've done and you change things that you'll, your insurance needs will be different. Usually every parish I go to, I ask that we just kind of look it over and make sure it's up to date. So St. Thomas of Canterbury and Greendale, somehow the garage was not listed. Um, in the insurance coverage. It was noted, it wasn't noted anywhere that there was a garage, oh. for example. That was big. Um, but uh, St. Mary's Dowsman also had not been done in years and years. So not a bad idea. And church insurance, um, those agents uh, are really, they really want to be helpful and they're, they're quite responsive. Yeah. And they, they know churches. <laughs> And so mm -hmm. they, they, they speak the language before they come in. It's really helpful. Yeah. 
Well, I'm not sure. I, I don't know how familiar people are with St. Boniface, but we lost a priest and we are now in preliminary discussion with the diocese of it becoming a potential replant. So it has, so far we have the idea, it's just the idea as the part of the diocesan staff and diocesan resource team. And so, but it's just all preliminary and our heads are spinning just a tiny little bit. Um, <laughs> but we're very excited about a uh, potential to grow because we, I mean, you guys, I'm one of the youngest people at our church and that's sad, you know? Um, we're just turning into a bunch of older people that and at some point we can't sustain it anymore. We just can't. Bishop Lee would told the story um, of when he was out in near Seattle, um, there was a, a church that said, we need a Sunday school. We need to grow all these things. And they're in a retirement community. And, and <laughs> they have tons of new people coming in who moved to this um, attractive retirement community. And their, their church was growing and growing, but they're all old people <laughs> coming, which was good. And, and, and he perceived it as they're growing and growing, and this is great. And you know people keep coming. And so it's a sustainable growth. But they, they thought, well, we're failing unless we have this great Sunday school. Yeah. So it's just a, a mind shift thing right. there. Well, if we had people, I, I don't care how old they are. They just walked in the door, we'd be, mm -hmm. I'm Scott, just walk in the door. I'll take you. I don't care how old you are. But you know, when we do get the occasional new person, we try not to like glom onto that poor soul because you know, <laughs> we don't want to scare him or her away. It's a fine uh, yeah. balance, isn't it? Ash Wednesday, of all things, we had two brand new people. We had a 5.30 p.m. service and two people showed up out of it. I talked to both of them, I haven't seen them since. Mm. Might be me. You might, you might see them again on Easter. Right, exactly, Sarah, exactly. Yeah. They may have had a great experience and wanna come back the next time they wanna to go to church, what might be nice. Easter. One was, one was only 28, a lifelong Episcopalian from Florida, works at Camp Minicani, super into youth. I was like, oh, honey. But what do we have to offer her? You know, right now, nothing. So we'll see. We'll see. You have an announcement. If uh, you have not yet done so, again, everything I'm saying is to the, the good folks gathered here and those who will watch the recording. Um, records indicate that there's about, uh, what, 14 or so parishes that have not yet completed their parochial reports or gotten the diocese their list of uh, deputies to attend the fall convention. So that uh, information, if that has not yet been sent, uh, needs to be sent. Uh, so please uh, attend to that if you haven't done so already. And if you have questions, about how to fill out the parochial report or uh, either the parish uh, statistical part or the financial part, um, give us a call at uh, diocesan offices and we will absolutely help you with that. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I was told to remind him. Yep. <laughs> hey, Sarah, I saw that St. Boniface was on the list of not giving you the deputy information, but I thought I gave that to you like late last fall. Did the list that I sent out was the um, the contact information. I don't know if there's overlap. I mean, the deputy list needs to be signed and sent in, and that's okay. apparently a canonical requirement. And so that one has to be physically sent in, I, you know, with a signature on it. The contact information can just be filled out online. Okay. And if you're not sure if your deputy list is sent in, just call Barb at the office and she will tell you right away. Yep. But we need to have um, documentation of the elected deputies, otherwise, um, and that has to be certified, otherwise they can't serve as a deputy, right? Yep. yep. That's it. And are you all still thinking the convention will be in person? Yeah. We're still planning it. Italian Community Center. Yep. But we're getting good at redoing things if we need to. <laughs> but but I, I'm, I'm excited about planning that. 
That is the plan. Seventh and eighth. Scott, would you like to wrap us up in prayer? Love to. Mm -hmm. Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. The loving God, on this feast of St. Patrick, we remember a faithful and holy man carried away in slavery at the age of 16. Six years later, escaped, went back to his home where he learned and grew in faith and then send, said, send me back to the people who enslaved me. And there he would begin his mission and his ministry of bringing your light and your love and your peace to the people of Ireland and by extension to the world. We thank you for the gift of faith and for the faith of those who have gone before us and has nurtured, supported, and sustained us. We ask you, Lord, to give us that kind of regenerative faith that reaches out and strengthens and empowers and supports those around us in our lives. Send us, Lord, now into the rest of this night in your peace and in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Good night. God bless everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night.